we should move on to wisdom literature. Actually, we're in Proverbs. We're going to kind of back up a bit and, and run through a few things we touched on last week, just to bring us up to speed, talk about a few other ideas in the book of Proverbs, and then hopefully introduce the book of Job. I don't know how far into it we'll get. We certainly won't finish Job, um, A, because the length of Job is quite interesting, and the content of Job, um, particularly as I've been reading more about it this last week, is really you know, it's really thought-provoking stuff there. So here is what we say. We introduce Proverbs. We have uh, its Hebrew name, which means Proverbs. Its root is comparison. If you remember this, this mashal word here, its root in Hebrew is comparison. And we talked a little bit. We'll see a little bit later as we look at different types of comparisons that Proverbs are often these couplets that compare and contrast an idea. Um, and this is the first line of the book in Hebrew, uh, which is the Proverbs of Solomon, uh, Mishael, Solomon, Ben David, son of David, Melech, Israel, king of Israel. Uh, why is it the Proverbs of Solomon? Because 1 Kings tells us he wrote 3,000 Proverbs, or he spoke 3,000 Proverbs and 1,005 Psalms. You know, you think of David when you think of Psalms and music, but Obviously, the gene was passed on to the next generation, over a thousand songs uh, that Solomon wrote. Now, while Solomon would be a key contributor to the book of Proverbs, he's by no means the only source of Proverbs, a, a huge source. And in fact, even if he were the only contributor, all 31 chapters of Proverbs do not contain 3,000 of his Proverbs. We, we talked a little bit last week that there is a, we can see evidence of some organization and even some compilation of the book of Proverbs internally to it. Uh, Proverbs itself, when we get to one of the sections, says there, these are more Proverbs of Solomon, but look, compiled by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. So we're several generations down the line past Solomon. Uh, so Solomon, we wouldn't say, is the author of Proverbs because we have this internal evidence that it was compiled, uh, probably, well, obviously later than Solomon's life. Um, and so we have this idea. We looked at a, an outline of it, and I'm going to go through this real quickly because we did talk about this uh, last week. We're going to spend more time here tonight, the first seven verses that introduce it, really the first verse we read a minute ago that says the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. And then verses two through seven are vitally important laying out the purpose of the whole book of Proverbs. And then the next section, verses, or chapter one, verse eight, through the end of chapter nine, uh, are a different kind of discourse uh, type of Proverbs. And a, an interesting part, this chapters eight and nine personifies wisdom itself. Then we get to this long section here of the Proverbs of Solomon, 10 through most of 22, a short section of we don't know who said these things, and then more, chapter 24, more anonymous sayings, a very shorter section, and then chapter 25, we just looked at that verse, more Proverbs of Solomon, and then the last couple of chapters are, call them what you want, appendices is the, the word that I use and saw in some commentaries because we have three different sections, sayings of Ager, sayings of King Lemuel, but we really don't know much about either of these guys. And then the, uh, the virtuous woman or virtuous wife, acrostic, Aleph to Tav here, 22 verses, all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet ends this um, book. So here's what I want you to do. If you have your copy of your Bible, I want, to, I want you to look at something because I, I, I did several sections here, but you could look at Proverbs in a, in a little bit different way. You could look at it almost in three big sections, and I want to show you uh, so, some ways that we might delineate this. The first section would be chapters 1 through 9, and then chapters 10 through 29, and then chapters 30 and 31. Um, and if you were to open and look at most of verse, chapters 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and compare it when you get to chapter 10 to the typesetting that's done in your copy of the scriptures. And you'll notice that chapter 10 is where the couplets start. Between each verse, beginning in chapter 10, is a, is a space. 
If you back up to, to the previous chapters, there might be paragraphs, several verses that are tied together before there's a space. Do you see that physically in the, the way it's laid out? Um, that's an interpretive decision, by the way. Uh, if you were to pick up the scroll of Proverbs, they wouldn't space it like this. Um, one, because writing implements were so very expensive that to use this kind of typeset or writing and spaces would require more length and that would be a much more expensive proposition. There's no guarantee you can even get it, get the materials you need. Um, but but a, a translation or a modern decision here in our typesetting shows you the difference. Um, that chapter 10 begins what we call, again, the couplets. There, each verse has this uh, sort of structure that is a comparison between the first part and the second part. And then again, if you go to chapter 30, you'll see, once again, we're back to longer sections. Now, there are places inside chapters 10 through 29 that you will see uh, more verses. Most of those are in, in those uh, anonymous sayings, and a few are in the Proverbs of Solomon. Um, but, but as a rule, we see the first nine chapters and the last two chapters, even in the type setting shows you there's a little bit of difference in what's going on there. Um, Proverbs as a piece of wisdom literature, as we said in this section of the Hebrew Bible, that's what we're dealing with. Uh, the idea is this, wisdom is something that could be learned and passed on. So what we don't find in Proverbs is a lot of historical reference. You can't look at this like we did with some of the Psalms and say this was written in response to this historical event or this was particularly out of this time, though we may be able to make some inferences. Largely, it's got no connection to particular historical events. It comes out of a class of people working in the kind of the upper echelons of Israel. Uh, we know King, obviously Solomon being one, David and Solomon, the, the two key, Saul a little bit, and the later ones, uh, prophets, very important in Israel's history. And then in the court of the king were sages, and they're part of their job, and we see them delineated a few times in scripture for different uh, roles. Part of their job was to maintain the wisdom literature and to pass it on to future generations. They were very much of the idea that this content could be very much transferable. It could be learned. And it was vital that it be learned because, uh, well, in fact, like chapter four, for instance, we could look at that. Um, the, the beginning part of chapter four, verses one through nine, talks about the idea that your father's instructions, you pay attention and gain understanding. Verse three, I was a son to my father, verse four, and he taught me. And he said, take hold of the words and with all your heart, verse five, get wisdom, get understanding. Central to the idea is this is transferable. This, this is preserved uh, and kept so that it could be passed on. What's the purpose of this transferable wisdom? It, it's to help people understand practically, because a lot of it is a more practical side, how to live out the covenant obligations that Israel was given through the law, through the Torah. So in, in some ways, this is kind of that, that rubber meets the road part of, of this, this section in Scripture, Proverbs, how you can take these, these laws and interpret and understand and practically use them. Uh, and wisdom is, in many ways, just that. Um, for instance, I know, Tillman, you're a man of many skills. You were uh, quite the electrical contractor. Now, I can tell you that when I walk back to that switch and flip it up or down, lights go on and off. However, I have that, and I know that there's electricity that runs through wires that are connected to that switch and are connected to these lights. However, <coughs> you have the wisdom that when the light's out, you can get inside the wires and make it work again, right? You don't, you don't want me doing that. I mean, I've done it on small things, but big stuff like that, that's... So in some ways, wisdom is applied knowledge. I have basic knowledge. but it, And so the idea being in, in Hebrew culture, the law 
is a, the a revelation of God of himself. Here's knowledge. And the Proverbs help apply it to the practical areas of life that you can, in fact, gain wisdom and understanding and, and live out what God requires of you through the Proverbs. In fact, we're going to look at now that kind of opening prologue, as I called it, um, verses two through seven, because here we have kind of the main themes of how we're going to, how you can look at the purpose of what comes next, not themes. I'm going to take that back. The purpose of how you should take the rest of Proverbs. So these are the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, verse one. And what are they given for? Verse two, for gaining wisdom and instruction for understanding words and insight. So again, that's practical. Chapter one, verse two. Um, so why do we have a book of Proverbs? One purpose is so that you can gain wisdom and instruction. Uh, to have understanding and insight. That, that's an important thing. So sometimes you're going to read through here and that's what it's going to be. Verse three tells you it's also for restrict, receiving instruction in prudent behavior to do what is right and fair and just. So that's a purpose of Proverbs, not just to get knowledge and wisdom, but then to, to do it. By the way, does that sound like a New Testament book to you? Maybe James? I think I said this last week. Uh, in, in many ways, James is the New Testament parallel. It's kind of the wisdom literature of the New Testament, very practical. And, and we would see here, don't just show me your faith by, I'll show you my faith by, by my works. Faith without works is dead. And you can see that for, for receiving instruction and then doing what is right. Verse three, verse four, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. There's that training aspect. Start them in this, this stuff should start when you're young, so you can understand it and put it into practice. Verse five, and even for the old who are wise, let them listen and add to their learning. So no one's beyond the scope of the wisdom that's contained in the book of Proverbs. Verse six, for understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Now that's an interesting thing, right? That verse six says that, that you know, sometimes there's stuff that's hard to understand and particularly among sages, uh, riddles, right? That's Samson, uh, something about out of, I can't remember the riddle, but you probably know the answer, the honey that he found in the carcass of the lion, and they, they found out his riddle. So, so the idea is that Proverbs can help you even in the difficult, tricky parts. And then verse seven, maybe the, the greatest theme in all of the Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the purpose of this book is to keep you from being a fool. That's a good goal, right? I mean, that's a very good goal. Don't be stupid. I think that should be, you know, a worthy goal for any of us. So, so here we have in the opening prologue, uh, the compiler that put this book together, wherever that was, and it could have, this could have been written by Solomon. We don't know, but likely not because it's got that this was probably a later introduction to the book to say, why did we put these sayings together for these purposes? Now, I think I mentioned last week, but again, just kind of reviewing. The other reality of this is that much of this might have been put together for training the next king. That part of what the, the young that we're going to learn uh, and deal with the, the difficulties of life and know how to live out the covenant, one of the most important pupils would be the son of the king who would one day step into that role. And if nothing else, you would want the future king of, of Israel or Judah to have as the basis for their thoughts and their decisions and their actions and understand a practical understanding of the outworkings of the covenant of the Torah that could be expressed in their life. And so that becomes an interesting kind of sub theme to this whole book is passing it on, not yes, to, to the, the nation in general, because the more of the people of Israel that abided by the covenant, the better, but also, and particularly to the heir who would need and would lead the people of Israel as they sought to follow God's word. Okay, let's talk about... Um, 
types of proverbs. I said com comparison is key. So, so I just want to run through. These are different ways the writer of Proverbs, and I'm going to be mostly in the couplets section. So most of these are going to come after chapter nine, um, in these, these two-line couplets. There are different ways that a proverb can be written that, that show that sort of comparison. Um, one is just called, they call it a folk saying. This is sort of like wisdom passed down uh, through the ages. The appetite of laborers works for them. Their hunger drives them on. So, you know, it's kind of like we have old wives tale, just a, a wise adage that, that gets passed on. Some of them would just be, and, and in many ways, this is common sense, right? If, if, if you're hungry and you need to, to do something to get food, you'll, you, you'll be driven, right? I mean, you'll, you'll do what it takes. You'll go and offer yourself for day labor, which in the Hebrew culture was the lowest of the low. Um, Jesus's parable of the ones that were hired at the end of the day, the, you know, that would be particular. They were the really low on the totem pole. So we see it's kind of just a, a folk saying, what, lore. Um, there's also kind of a paradox between the two. So, so here we see one who is full loath honey from the comb, but to the hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. So, so the paradox is if you got a full stomach and you get some honey, if you're really full, even that's not, and honey would be like land flowing with what? Milk and honey. Honey's the best for, for their culture. It was a, 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 just a wonderful thing, a luxury. Some of it was from bees, some of it was from dates, different kinds of honey, but, but this is kind of the top, the, the luxurious side of the food chain. So if you're full, even the best of the best, it's just okay. But when you're hungry, what will you eat? I think, did I use this week, last, last week? That I think I used this verse last week in another context, but we watched some of those uh, survival television shows, and when they're out there and they're hungry, they eat some crazy stuff. I mean, oh. You know what a balut is? I, I can't ever believe this, this is this is people eat this. Like some cultures, it's a delicacy, but you've got people from mostly North America. This isn't something we eat. It's a it's a, I believe it's a duck egg with a partially mature duck inside, but still lots of the slime egg stuff, and they eat that. If you're hungry, it tastes good. <laughs> it tastes real good. But if you're not hungry, no thank you, right? Um, so, so there's a paradox there. We see the comparison that way. Um, there, there's an analogy. Like cold water to a weary soul, good news is good news from a distant land. So you've been outside, you've been working, you've been, you've been doing something, particularly in South Florida. Maybe you just went outside to walk the dogs for five minutes and you come back inside. There's nothing like a cold cup of water. Actually, I'd take iced tea. <laughs> but cold water works too, right? Uh, and that, that's analogous. That's that, the, as refreshing as that water is, so is good news. Uh, this says from a distant land, but from anywhere, really, good news is, is refreshing. So this paints a picture, an analogy of sorts. Sometimes it's to the absurd. Why should fools have money in hand to buy wisdom when they are not able to understand? It? So if fools could buy wisdom, they wouldn't know a value and bargain if it slapped them in the face, <laughs> right? If you gave your three-year-old a hundred dollars and said, "Go buy dinner," it'd be candy. <laughs> at best, it'd be candy. I'm thinking it'd be a Lego or a doll or 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 they'd say, "I don't know where it went. I lost it." <laughs> yeah. um, so you know, the idea is just it's just this like the absurdity of some of it. Um, proportional. I don't know. I don't quite understand what this means in the in the way of organizing it. But this is kind of a commentary or a scholarly way of looking. Better a small serving of vegetables with love than a fattened calf with hatred. So if you're sitting with your family, people you love, and all you got is a little thing of veggies, it's good. If you're sitting with your bitter enemy and they put a steak in front of you, you're probably not going to enjoy it. You just want out of it. Right, somebody that's exploited you, somebody that's betrayed you. I don't care. I don't care that it's a filet mignon. Get me out of here. Um, so, so there's this this sense there. I think one last one: cause and effect. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. So, wealth 
we know that's a good thing, but the effect of wealth in the day of wrath is, is meaningless. But righteousness, what's its effect? Oh, it's a lot better. So, so there's a there are certain commodities we might have, and, and what effect do they bring about? And in weighing them, the, the proverb says, make sure you choose the better of the commodities for your uh, way of thinking there. So, so there's a variety of types of these couplets. Um, so, so I say all this to, to kind of go back to the big picture view of Proverbs. And in general, with scripture, um, you know, when, when you're reading, and, and I, I, I do a lot of reading on my phone, like a, a lot of you are using the app, um, but sometimes paper and ink has different benefits. And, and sometimes in this, like looking at, just sometimes just take a minute before you read and just look. And, and how it looks might tell you some things. And then particularly as we're in Proverbs, think about what, what it's doing. What, what's the purpose of this? this? This book has been given for a particular reason. And, and then consider these different ways it sets up in these couplets and in these wisdom sayings, what it's trying to bring about. And of course, as I said a minute ago, what's the, the, the most important theme in all of Proverbs? It's got to be the fear of the Lord. It shows up a lot of times. Um, if you're looking to write them down, <laughs> Proverbs, obviously one, verse seven. Uh, 9, 10, 10, 27, 14, 27, 15, 16, 16, 6, 19, 23. That was a good year. 22, 4, 23. I don't know. It was roaring. Yeah. The roaring 20s. 22, 4, 23, 17, 24, 21. All of them talk about the fear of the Lord. Uh, and, and as the beginning verse says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Elsewhere, it says the beginning of wisdom. The idea is uh, from this wisdom literature, God, the God of Israel in this case, is very particularly in mind. I think we, we discussed that a bit last week. Has at his disposal and possesses all wisdom. And he chooses to reveal it, to dispense it to humans through various ways, uh, certainly the Torah, the law, and other, other wise people in history. And so the only way to get to the, the full, I say blessings of, or meaning of the wisdom is to understand and to, in this case, fear God, the fear of the Lord, to, to have that reverent awe of the God who dispenses wisdom. Uh, and yes, fear at times, it does mean fear, by the way. A lot of times we as preachers are going, no, 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 you don't have to be afraid of God. No, it is a terrible thing, the scripture says, to fall in the hands of a holy God. It's not a good thing. That, that's I forget where that is, but it, it, it's a frightful thing. Our God is a consuming fire. So yeah, there are times when to, you, we, we should fear the Lord. Growing up, there were times that I it was actually fear of my parents should I get caught that kept me from doing things I didn't. I shouldn't have done, right? So, so fear isn't necessarily a negative. There is a component of that. When we understand the true beauty and awesomeness and holiness of God, there should be a component of fear. Uh, you know, what does Isaiah say when he sees God? I am undone. What, what do people say when the angels appear in all their glory? Well, they, what do the angels say to the people, I should say, every time? Fear not, because why? There's something to be afraid of. <laughs> And, and so the fear of the Lord, yes, it has that, that idea, but there, there's also, and maybe a greater, the, my favorite, yeah, I'll say favorite definition is reverent awe. Awe has in it yeah. an element of an understanding, the awesomeness of God and the reverence that comes from that. So fear of the Lord, that understanding is the beginning of wisdom. And that, that traces all through um, the book of Proverbs. One other big theme, actually, and this might be surprising, probably the second topic that shows up a lot, the power of our speech. Again, James, the New Testament equivalent, has a whole section on the tongue. There's a lot in Proverbs about speech. Life and death is in the tongue. That's Proverbs, right? I mean, I mean that's it. In fact, it lists seven things the Lord hates. Three of them happen from our tongue, right? I, did I write it down? Nice. 
Proverbs 6 is where this is, 16 through 19. We'll just go there real quick. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, what's number two? A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, fears that are feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. How do you stir up conflict? Usually rumors, gossip, and all of that sort of thing. So three of the seven things the Lord hates, almost half, just less than half, involve the tongue. So Proverbs has much to say um, about minding our speech, that, that it is powerful, that, that life and death, that our words matter. Uh, it's no accident, by the way, that John would then call Jesus the word of God. Um, we're made in the image of God, right? And part of that image, God's words are omnipotent, all-powerful, but our words do have power. That old rhyme, sticks and stones, blah, 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 is a big lie, right? Has anybody here ever been hurt by what somebody said about them or to them? Yes. If you haven't, I'm impressed. <laughs> but all of us have been on the wrong side of those things. And so so speech is another huge uh, emphasis. But as you get older, you don't care anymore. You don't care anymore? Yeah, it does help. Yeah. We'll call that wisdom. Okay. <laughs> we'll call that wisdom. I don't think Francis is over there, is he? Yeah, he's, he's over there. I saw him. Did you go to the again when the side doors are locked? I mean, there's a thread, yellow tape on the wall. Uh, yeah. Do you, um, Susan, which one does he, did he open? Did he open the far one last time? Um, Ethan Price? Yeah. I think it was the one that's closest to your house. Okay. <laughs> I'll just text him and say, ask him which door is open and see if he answers. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead and do that if you have your key handy. Are you practicing tonight? Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. I have a text to you. Oh, All right. Here we go. Any questions? Any comments about Proverbs? Yeah, I've been thinking a few things. Okay. Who. English American, English speaking, do they use this uh, word uh, uh, proverbs? Its meaning is more, I guess, a general true of a piece of uh, advice, sort of that area. That means, the proverb means, do they use, appears to be, Listening you today, all the things. Uh, what is way back? They talk like that. That means that they're either Greek or uh, in an English uh, translated meaning. That's why they show you it. But it has a lot of more depth of uh, wisdom in it to people to understand. So way back, people, either Jewish or, I don't know, <laughs> there is a- Well, certainly writing. when you translate from one language to another, you always lose some. I mean, you would know that. Um, trying to translate Korean to English, you can't get it. it doesn't always mean exactly the same thing. There's, always, right. loose, there's something always lost in translation. Right. Um, we do the best we can to try to convey the meaning in English of these Hebrew words. But like we talked about with Psalms, sometimes we just, there's some things we can't at all, like alliteration or rhyme or some of the things that will be present in the original language aren't there. Like um, I'm trying to think, you know, we don't use the word proverb in our language as yeah, much, we would say an adage, or here's an old saying, um, or that's an old, trying to think of one that would, would fit, um, and I can't think of a, of a good one. Offhand, does anybody have like a, a, a an old, old saying? An old wives' tale saying? Maybe something like that, yeah. Don't count your chickens before they have. There you go, don't count your chickens before, so that's a, that would be a proverb, 
in, in our idea, but we don't think of it that way. We, we usually, really, Proverbs is often related to when somebody's saying it, the Bible, book of Proverbs, even though we have sort of our own. And I think that comes out of Aesop, doesn't it? Aesop's favorite. You see, way back, way, way, way back, when person, especially Solomon, able to speak that way, that means uh, he's got, I guess, a lot more wisdom than anybody and can think this day, even though their language or our language to really, uh, really fully feel to truly understand. But some of, I do mostly able to uh, right. comprehend the meaning of a behind. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm getting into. Maybe way back, those people are a lot smarter than we are. <laughs> uh, we don't speak that way. And the English was that. So anything, and this is 3,000 years old, some of this. Solomon reigned about 1,000 BC. Yeah. It was a long time. So right. culture is much different. Language is much different. The general conditions of life 3,000 years ago, much different. Um, you know, wealth to us meant one thing. Wealth to them would mean something totally different. Um, we would, if, if I wanted to rate wealth now, we'd probably talk about your stock portfolio, your you know different things, your properties, blah blah. Back then, you'd ask how many chickens you have. You know, it's all different. More natural, uh, yeah. And, and you know, Solomon had money. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> so yeah, it, if that means a whole that you go through that part is easy come, each you don't feel it. But right. e when you're getting easily something received. It's meaning nothing on right. And some of the parties, uh, uh, you don't really work hard and you don't get it really uh, value of uh, true, uh, those kind of things. That's what's all in there. Sure. Yeah, so that's what I'm getting out of it. But it's a hard way to really read to. Yeah. Yeah. Get it quickly, which is which is part of, in general bigger picture why I wanted to do this because what I hope to do is help us because we are three thousand years removed and culturally removed and language removed. What are some things we can do to help us get a handle on stuff that's harder to understand for those reasons? Um, and so hopefully then, we're, we're the finding some of those tools. We come this class to problem means. In the Bible, the section is more towards guilt. That it, that's what I'm getting out of. Toward guilt? You said toward yeah. guilt? Uh, yeah. Geared, okay. Yeah. Right, I got Probably, you. Okay. Proverbs, Proverbs section of the Bible is a lot more geared towards that way to explaining. And, and it's it's unique in that when you when you read a, a chapter, for instance, of couplets, and it's what 27 verses long, and the couplets might not have any relation to each other at all. Mm -hmm. You could read verse one that has nothing to do with verse two, that has nothing to do with verse three, and you read a whole chapter, it's like poof, wow. Yeah, uh, I don't, <laughs> yeah well, it, it's good. Yeah. It's maybe a couple jump out at you every time you read, which is why. Some people use it since there's 31 chapters. Some people read a chapter every uh, a chapter a day based on the day of the month. So the third, they read the third chapter, the seventh, they read the seventh chapter, just to kind of keep it constantly coming. But it, even in that way, it's hard to understand um, because, you know, we typically, like when I do my reading through the Bible plan, I'm going to read four or five chapters of Proverbs a day. And that's a lot. Of da -da 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 -da. There's no story. There's no character. There's no history. There's no, there's no theme. It's just, Boom, 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 boom. And so that doesn't help it. our understanding. Too. I've been skipping. I didn't want to read it. <laughs> and then now I'm glad, yeah, I'm learning more depth of uh, really content, what it is about. Yeah, that's important to me. Now, yes, Todd. Did Solomon, Solomon ask for wisdom from the angels so he could acquire <laughs> wealth or so he could acquire power or so he could acquire the ability 
to convey. Well, when he was the offered to his people, when he was offered the choice of ask what you will, and he yes. chose wisdom, God said to him, because you have chosen wisdom, I'm also going to give you all these other things. What his motives were, <laughs> it, it, the assumption of the text is that at that point they were pure. Right. But over time, obviously, we see in Solomon, when we get to Ecclesiastes, <laughs> especially, it's not always pure motives. It's not always straight thinking. He was the wisest man who ever lived who did some really stupid things. Well, but he still disembarked his wisdom to the people. Or, or Hence this gave point. it to the Sure. Told it to the people. And uh, because he was the wisest man. And he used his wisdom in ruling Israel to, to help it to prosper and to build the temple. And so there's, there's many great accomplishments that come out of the wisdom of Solomon right. and a, a legacy of that wisdom that we benefit from even today. Mm -hmm. But we can't say his life was unaffected by folly because there are times that well, the wisest man who ever lived. He achieved quite a few things. You hear about Solomon's mom, Angie. Here. Sure. Obviously. Chief, but he still had to uh, tell the people the word. Indeed. It yeah. almost sounded like he had a nervous breakdown at the end. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you wonder um, what was going on. And actually, hopefully, when we get to Ecclesiastes, you'll leave that not seeing it as quite so negative. There's some things about it that. Yes, or negative, we can't get around them. But there's 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 some things as well that hopefully will give us a little. Hey, maybe Solomon, in spite of his either his cynicism or whatever he's narcissism or whatever ism, um, kind of had a base of. He of had goodness. enough. What's that? He had enough. He had plenty. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What do you say we move on to our next friend? Okay. And get a job. Job, book of Job. Well, we're going to the Hebrew order, not the Old Testament order. So interesting you should say that because you think about the Latin. We did Psalms, Proverbs, Job. Um, in our text of the Old Testament, it's Job, Psalm, and Proverbs. These three are, are linked, if you remember. We said this when we first introduced wisdom literature as the documents of truth. Uh, they're used in worship and they're they're annotated and laid out differently for use in the way that they're, they're chanted or or I guess you'd say canted like a cantor in the Jewish service. Um, and so Job is in that that vein, even though the order is a little different, they're still together in, in our English version. Um, this is Job's name, Job. Um, the, the Aleph is sort of a silent beginning, and then the Y and the B at the end. Uh, his name means persecuted, and some say you can see the root for he who weeps, which would make sense if we know his story. And it is a fascinating story, isn't it? Yeah. Let's talk about Job. Question number one, people ask, maybe you don't ask, but this is a question that's been asked. Did Job exist? Was there a literal person named Job, or was this uh, an allegory or whatever? I think Job existed. I think there was a literal Job, and that what happened in this book would be a, a, a retelling of his, his life in so many ways. Uh, it's a very stylized retelling. It's a very literary retelling. We'll talk about that as we go through. Um, but I think Job was a real life dude, because not in that, you know, we have fiction all the time, but in that culture, you wouldn't have a this kind of a document is not typically a, a fake sort of made up person that, that was trying to tell a story. This would be, this would make sense. And the way it's presented would give credence, in my view, Job existed. Um, Job is an interesting character. We are in the Hebrew Bible, but guess what Job is not? Exactly. Which is, you know, you probably, uh, some of you reacted to that, like you always assume Job was Jewish. But it says at the very beginning that he's not from Israel. He's from the land of, of us, or Uz, or whatever you want to call it. Uz. Um, if you go back to the genealogies of Abraham, you'll see that name in the genealogy. 
we usually associate it with uh, Edom or Aram. So we're, I don't have a map, but you basically know where Israel is along the coast. Edom was across the Jordan River, right? To the, to the west, no, to the east, excuse me, and south, Edom and Aram are down there. Um, we know in the book that, that part of what happens is um, the Chaldeans come in and cause some of the destruction and the Sabaeans come in and both of those, the Sabaeans would have been, by the way, Petra would have been where the Sabaean territory was. They would come up from the south and the Chaldeans would come down from the north. Uh, so Uz is not part of Israel. Uz is separate from Israel. So it's very unique that we have this very long piece of wisdom literature that is likely about a non-Israelite. However, having said that, he is definitely a believer in the God of Israel. There is much in this would, that would say that's the God that Job is responding to. That is in has, has a conversation of sorts with later. Um, not just because it's in the Hebrew Bible and that's their God, but because we we see things in it that tell us that that these would be things that would indicate. For instance, um, he says at one point that he doesn't bow to the sun or the moon god. And in the ancient Near Eastern faiths, that would be normal. In fact, you could go to just about any of the other ancient Near Eastern faiths outside of Israel, the monotheistic. Israelite religion, Judaism, and there are multitudes of gods that focus around the natural world. So sun and moon would be key to some things that happen in the natural world. And he talks about he doesn't bow to gold. There's a whole section where he says, I don't bow to any of these other gods that would have been normal gods of the ancient Near East that, that ties him to um, Israel. By the way, that's in Job 31, 26 is where he mentions the sun and the moon before and after it. That whole section is him basically saying, um, things about the fact that his faith is not like every other faith in the ancient Near East. And we've talked all along, Judaism is very unique in ancient, it shares characteristics uh, of the way culturally it acted, but their actual faith in this monotheistic God was very unique. And, and its expression through the covenant was also very unique to Israel and stood in great contrast to the surrounding nations. So the things in Job, though it doesn't say he's an Israelite, uh, point to he has faith in the God of Israel. By the way, we think um, that would that shouldn't surprise us because Job is generally thought to be, as far as time frame, very early. We're the patriarchal period, many people place the, the story of Job in. Um, the land of Uz, we know, later became Edom or Aram. And so the fact that it's still called Uz when somebody writes it here in Job 1 tells us it's, it's early when the land was identified by the descendant of Abraham that went wherever they went. Those were the first names to the land before later things happened. And so, um, so there's a lot that indicates this is a very early uh, document of a person. And, and, you know, when we talk about like Abraham, you say, of course, Abraham was Jewish. Well, not at first. He, he existed before there was anything that we would call Judaism. And he's, he's an Ur of the Chaldees, Ur and Uz. Ur is up there, Uz is down there. He's an Ur, he's not in Israel, and he's called to Israel, and he starts the ball rolling. So, so that period of time, as far as an Israelite religion, really isn't a particularly formal codified one, but these individuals show their faith is in the God who would reveal himself in what we call Judaism. Um, as I said, Job is a book that is very literary in its construction and in its treatment. Um, we have things like uh, dialogue, narrative, soliloquies, a discourse, a hymn is kind of in the middle of it somewhere, all of these different literary forms put together. So, so as we might say, as a piece of literary art, it's quite varied and beautiful. But in saying that, we need to understand that when you read it, 
you know, we, we can also see like the speeches or the, the discussions between the two. You can see elements of poetic things in there. And, and this, this dialogue, you might say it's very stylized. It's not like the off the cuff speech. Why is that? I would suggest that a lot of what we see, we've talked about this very many times as we've gone through, Hebrew is an oral language. Uh, scripture was not recorded for easy access at the time. It was passed on by oral uh, memorization and recitation. And so what helps memorization and recitation, but certain poetic and narrative and whatever forms that, that are easier to memorize. Um, we probably memorize songs really quickly because there's a certain structure and beat associations with it. And so some of the poetic forms allow that to happen. So it's a very literary, as far as a piece of literature, it's varied and it's beautiful. Um, now, the question is, what's it about? Is it about suffering? <laughs> well, you could say there's suffering in it. Seems to be an important thing. Is it about God's justice somehow righting wrongs? So we, we see that that sort of is a factor in it. Is it about Job? Well, Yes, it's called Job after all. Um, but as we've said several times, when we get to, to the Hebrew books, in particular, this is that has a, a person as its title or titular character and theme and driving force. Though Job's name is on the book, who is the book about? It's about God. So if we don't come to the book of Job, I mean, Job is, uh, isn't there like a, isn't he an example um, of, of patience and suffering? I'm thinking there's actually, yeah, the patience of Job, right? The Job is this exemplar of patience that we should study and emulate. I would suggest that's not the point of the book of Job. We're not reading the book of Job to learn how to be more patient. We're reading the book of Job to learn about God. Well, that's the whole Bible also. Yeah, but... It's easy at times to, to shift, mm -hmm. and maybe that's just from the shamanic musings part of, of me in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's important. So when we look at Job, a lot of people look at it and say, this, this book answers the question, why do the righteous suffer? Mm -hmm. And that may be, but I'm thinking there's another question that may be more important then do the, do the right, why do the righteous suffer? And it's the question that Satan asked of God in chapter one, verse nine. If I would suggest what question does the book of Job answer? This is the question I think it answers. Does Job fear God for nothing? Does Job, fear, chapter one, verse nine. Right. Does Job fear, serve, worship God for nothing? So what, what's the context of that question? Um, you know, it opens with this narrative passage, kind of the view is heaven. Satan comes up to heaven having a little conversation with God. And, uh, you know, in the conversation, um, Satan says he comes from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. So Satan presents this. As I've just been looking around at your creation, God, and what does God say? Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So that if God is saying that about you, that's pretty good, right? I mean, that put that on my tombstone. If that's the verdict of God over your life, that's impressive. For, for this, this man. So what in light of that statement, Satan asked the question, yeah, but does Job fear God for nothing? And then he elaborates. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Wow. We got us a showdown. Yeah. So my first thought is, wow, that's really cool what God says about Job. 
But if I'm Job, I'm saying, God, couldn't you have mentioned somebody else? <laughs> Anybody else? I mean, why was I the name you brought up? But nonetheless, um, it's there. Uh, and so Satan takes that and runs with it. Uh, does Job fear God for nothing? Or if you take all the blessings away, will he then instead of fear you and serve you and worship you, curse you? That's a, that's a tough question. What's, that has a lot of, 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 of meat to it. That's a different question, by the way, than why does God allow suffering? And there's this tension in the ancient world, in ancient Near Eastern belief and practice, and even we could see it in the Torah, this basic idea, some people call it um, the retribution principle or whatever, uh, that's, that's mentioned in, in talk about like Deuteronomy 28, blessings and cursings. If you obey, you're blessed. If you disobey, you're cursed. Well, this is yeah. just going by that, right? This is this is the, the and then we have on top of that this other ancient Near Eastern concept that theologians call the great symbiosis. How's that for a word? What is the great symbiosis? A symbiosis is a is a mutual relationship where each benefits from the other. And so this is this is what it means that God created. The gods, not, not Yahweh, but this is Molech or Baal or any. The gods created people because the gods had needs that the people would meet. So obviously you see these gods are pretty small if somehow people meet their needs. For instance, you go to temples, even Hindu temples today. What do they do? You'll see plates of food laid out in front of gods. This, is, this would be, uh, you go to certain cities and we've been in South America and to certain gods, there'll be plates of food or sacrifice chickens burned at intersections to the gods. And this is kind of a, uh, what's it called? Um, not voodoo, but um, anyway, one of those kind of Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean religions that's prevalent. Uh, food, San, that's it, Santeria. Food to the gods is normal. That, that people bring food offerings. To, by the way, Israel brings food offerings to God, right? So that's ancient Near Eastern offerings, right? And they bring grain and oil and, and, and drink. So, so the gods need food, so they created people to bring them food. The gods need shelter, they need a place to live, so they created people to build temples for them and on and on. So that's what the gods need from people. But then the temptation is to get those things, the gods need to bless the people so that they'll keep bringing the things to them that they need. So there's this called, as I said, the great symbiosis, an ancient Near Eastern idea that gods and humans are interdependent on one another, that gods created humans because they needed things from humans, and so gods bless humans because as the humans are blessed, they bring the things to the gods they need. That's not a biblical idea. That you don't find, that's not an a Israelite, a Jewish faith idea. But in the culture in which Job lived, that was a very common idea. When you get to the speeches and the discourses of his friends, you see very much that's some of that's underlying a lot of what they think. So the enemy or the accuser's question is, does Job fear God for nothing? If this is the way the culture, the world thinks about things, yeah, you're just propping Job up. Because you get benefit from him. And as long as you get benefit, you'll keep propping him up. And it works well for both of you. But if you don't benefit him anymore, it's going to curse you to your face. This, this is the conflict from the first chapter, as I think of the book, that's set out. And it's an interesting one. Um, so when you put, look at it from the perspective of Job, the question to him becomes, is he serving God? just as a way to get his needs met. Is what he's doing, is it about him? Because he's found out if I do these things, I have all this blessing? Or is it about God, that God in and of himself is worthy of service, no matter what? And so to get the answer to that question, Job suffers. And we'll see, will he continue to serve God when he loses it all. Well, he, he knows 
and puts all this trust in, in the Lord. So no matter what happens to him, he doesn't care. Well, that's because you've read the book. Yeah, so, yeah no, but that's you know the answer. Supposed to live. But this is this is the this is a question. By the way, this is an ancient reality that exists today. Today. Well, isn't that faith? Well, I'm thinking that's the faith. And you could call it that. That's what I. That's what I. But there are people today who, if things don't go well from them, they start cursing God. Yeah. No. And, and that's the extreme, right? The, the, this happen, and, and I've said this before, but it, it's more insidious than that. Because even as in my life, there have been times where things haven't gone well. And one of the thoughts that occurs to me is, have I somehow disappointed God? Like, did I not pray enough? And it, you know, I don't think I've thought this explicitly, but it's back there. Um that somehow if I just do the right things, God's obligated to me, which we know is not the case. Yes, his friends said to him, you did something wrong. Absolutely yeah. they did. Yeah. Um, and he said, I didn't do anything. Wrong. And so from the beginning, this is, I think this is the tension. This is the question that's at the heart of this book that unfolds. Um, this is more about, dare I say, Job's righteousness than his suffering that we know he's going to suffer. The question is, will he continue to be righteous? Will he continue to, to get the accolades from God? I mean, again, blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. The rest of this that's happened, I think is less about the calamities that befall Job and more about the character with which he responds to those calamities or the, the fate, we might say. Um, so if I might go one more step, is it possible that in this book, it's not Job that's on trial, but God. Job is the pawn in Satan's scheme to confront God in this way. Uh, Job's already, we just said, Job's righteous. According to God, Job's righteous. So the question is, really about God's policies, we might say. Satan isn't trying to tear down Job as much he's questioning how God acts in relation to his people. Well, in this example, you've already called Satan the accuser. That's one of the titles he gets, the accuser of the brethren. Now, Job, you said, was not Jewish, and all his friends are not Jewish. So he's like, they're like living in a town, and but he he has a relationship with God. Obviously, he's a commended by God. Yeah. But he's not, you know, he's not like this isn't happening in Jerusalem. This isn't happening in in the, the Holy Land. This is outside of Israel. So, so even then, way back in the beginning, when Job was, he didn't have to be a Jew to be uh, chosen by God. Because Joel was. That's what I. That's a good point. That's a good point. I hadn't thought of it. It's a very good point. Um, so, so this is the the fundamental tension or question that Job strives to answer. Again, it's not about Job. Who's it about? It's about God. Um, does God's treatment of people? Is it just? Is it right? Is there something faulty about God's system that somehow he just, he buys people's obedience and faith? And if he'll just take it away from them, he finds out they don't care. Interestingly enough, when God finally gets up and speaks, you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't answer any of the questions we've already asked in a, in a direct way. I mean, Job is the example. Um, he certainly doesn't give an answer for Job's suffering. His friends spend how many, 30 chapters basically badgering about why he's suffering. And if you just tell us the truth, this could be over. If you just repent and admit what you did wrong, this could be over. And come on, you idiot, do something to get this over with. And God doesn't stand up and answer any of that nonsense. God basically, and, and we'll get to this, um, God, God comes up and, and he's, he, he gives an interesting 
answer that basically asks over and over, were you there when? Were you there when? Like the question, is, oh, that's after seven. Sorry, I saw somebody close their, their book. I'm, so I'm sorry. Um, the question that, that God eventually answers is not justifying his treatment of Job, but justifying his character as the God of wisdom. And with that, we'll pick up more next week. Satan still uses this same thing on people all the time because when they have something that happens to them, they turn, many of them turn their back on God and blame God. Job didn't. But he, had a few moments so Satan still the uses the same lie. Sure. Well, the, the question at the heart, again, is God's character. And the reason people turn their back on it is because they buy Satan's line of reasoning that God's character is not trustworthy. And therefore, I don't need to fear him or follow him. So there we go. All right, we'll pick up there. We'll pick up with more of Job next week. And I will pray us out. And then we'll be dismissed. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you today for your love for us that... You demonstrated by the gift of Jesus. I thank you for your revelation through your word of your goodness, of your holiness, of your righteousness, of your justice, of your grace, and of your mercy. Thank you that we have accounts like Job's story to see how this righteous man, though confronted with unthinkable tragedy, allowed you to demonstrate that you are trustworthy, that you are faithful and true. Lord, I thank you for Solomon's life, an example that we still have the wisdom of this man from 3,000 years ago that we can read and learn from to help us apply your truth and your, your covenant words to our lives. Lord, I'm amazed and grateful, not only that you inspired the scriptures, but you preserved them for us to learn from today, that you, by your spirit, enlighten our hearts and minds to their truth that we might use them in the Monday through Fridays of our life, in the everyday, ordinary, practical ways to follow you. Thank you for everyone who's gone on this journey with us. I pray you'll help us to continue to learn more of you and your ways and your character. For That's what you have revealed in the scriptures. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.